Let's thank the Lord again. Father, we thank you for our uh, time together. I pray you give us clear minds as we're heading into the backstretch here, and I pray you uh, do this because we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to talk about republics and democracies and theocracies. Uh, not that they're uh, all on the same level, same plane. Repu uh, a republic is a particular form of government. A democracy is a particular form of government. And the third basic form of government is monarchy. So you've got monarchy, democracy, and republic. I'm, I'm painting with a broad brush here. In a monarchy, it's basically top-down governance. It could be a dictator, it could be a king, it could be a tyrant, it could be the emperor, but it's top down. That's a monarchy. Democracy is a bottom up uh, sort of governance. And in the very nature of the case, it has to be somewhat limited. So the uh, Greek city states that practiced democracy did so on a uh, city by city basis because uh, in a country like ours with 330 million people, how are you going to have a pure democracy? Unless we vote on referenda with your TV remote, you know. <laughs> That's a scary thought, right? Um, everybody vote, and uh, so it's just too cumbersome. It's too unwieldy. So democracies, when they have functioned at all, have usually functioned on a smaller scale in a particular uh, city or location, but democracies are bottom-up form of governance, and republics are representative forms of government. So you, uh, a particular section, district, or province represent, has a representative sent to a more central location where the other representatives gather, and that, uh, that is an operation that scales and because it scales, you can cover a larger uh, territory governing that way. But it, it too, is a bottom-up sort of uh, governance, but it's more regulated. Democracy is bottom-up, but more direct action. Republic is bottom-up, but it is more disciplined and, and uh, uh, carefully conducted. And then uh, a monarchy or dictatorship or... Uh, that sort of thing is top down. Now, each one of these forms of governance have an ecclesiastical counterpart, an ecclesiastical form, because churches govern themselves also. Um, you have democracies, which is what Baptist ecclesiology is, so uh, or congregational. So, congregationalism is a democracy. Uh, Baptist churches are a democracy. You have a congregational meeting. Everyone in the church uh, assembles. They're calling a new pastor or getting rid of the old pastor you don't like. Everybody comes to the meeting, including some of the people you thought were dead. <laughs> you know, all the, everybody turns out, and you have uh, an exuberant town hall meeting, and everything is settled right there. That's democracy, okay? And that's also frightening if, um, because... It, Crowds can get out of control, and you can uh, watch it stampede. You also have churches that have top-down governance, uh, monarchical. The Roman Catholic Church would be one obvious example, but Anglicanism uh, would be uh, the same sort of thing with the Archbishop of Canterbury. You've got top-down uh, authority flowing downward. Uh, Republic, um, the ecclesiastical uh, Republican form of governance uh, is basically historic, Protestant, and reformational, and is represented by the continental reformed churches and the Presbyterian uh, churches from in the English-speaking world, basically continental reformed and uh, English-speaking. And there are some differences between, uh, between the two, but broadly speaking, they are representative and can cover a broad uh, territory. I'm bringing this up because what people learn, how people learn to function in their churches is an incubator or a, uh, a startup area where you learn how to assume the responsibilities of a churchman, of a church member, and that transfers, right? that, that transfers. So uh, when um, the Reformation, uh, 
uh, John Calvin argued for the restoration of the ruling elder, uh, the ruling elder. Uh, in Geneva, they were called seniors, seniors. But what, what was unique about this in the, in the Protestant Reformation was that it included laymen in the governance of the church. Laymen, people who were unordained, who, who were not set apart to clerical orders, they were included in the decision-making of the church. This was a political revolution. It was a political revolution. Uh, so you, you picked out sober men, decent, dignified men who were businessmen, or doctors, and that sort of thing, and they, were, they would be called and set apart. They'd be ruling elders, and they'd be established in the rule of the church. So the rule of the church was shared by the ministers, the ordained men, and the, we call them parish elders or ruling elders. They come together in, uh, in the Presbyterian world, they're called a session. Um, uh, sometimes in the, the continental world, they're called a consistory, and sometimes there it's elders and deacons together, but it's broadly speaking the same kind of bottom-up representation. Now, I said that there's, there is transfer, things slop over. The first general assembly of the Presbyterian Church in, North, in, in America occurred in the city of Philadelphia in 1789. That was the same city and the same year that the Constitution was adopted. This was the same city and the same year because these men were all breathing the same air. Right? It, the, I'm talking about transfer. So representative self-government was something that was incubated in the churches, and after and, and people knew how to function there. And then in New England, particularly, it carried over into the township and the governance of the township. And then when we came to form a republic, and uh, the republic was formed, everybody already knew what they were doing. Everybody already knew how to conduct themselves in this sort of situation. Now, I said those are three. Those are structurally the three kinds of governance. And you can have, you can have democracies where um, it's not, uh, you can have decent democracies, just as you can have decent monarchies. But the reformers argued that the ideal form of governance was that of a republic. That would be Calvin's view. Calvin didn't mind working with monarchs. He didn't mind working for reformation with um, forms of government that he thought were suboptimal. At the same time, he, he definitely preferred a small r Republican form of government. But that doesn't, uh, that doesn't solve the central problem. In each of these forms of government, you're, we're talking about how people, how the people function. The demos, democracy is the rule of the people. Demos is the Greek word for people. So democracy is the rule of the people. Um, the, uh, in a monarch, you've got the, the word monos, meaning one. It's a top-down uh, sort of thing. But in a democracy or in a republic or in a monarchy, who is your God? Who's the, who is God? That brings up the question of theocracy. That brings up the, the, the doctrine of theocracy and I've got to be very careful and clear away a number of confusions here because I'm going to talk about uh, three cheers, maybe four cheers, depending on how the next month or two goes, um, for theocracy. And you're thinking, oh no, how am I, how am I going to explain this to Aunt Millie? <laughs> because this is a subject that is fraught with gigantic historical confusions. And I'm somewhat intimidated. I mean, it looks like a difficult task. How can I sell modern Americans, most of you are Americans, how can I sell modern Americans on theocracy? I mean, First Amendment, separation of church and state, what are you talking, you know, I can't believe it. It looks like a difficult task, like walking across a small lake of extra sticky butterscotch this butterscotch syrup and oversized snowshoes. And so I ask for your thoughtful prayers <laughs> that I'd be able to navigate this and that I would be lucid as I seek to answer the hard questions. One hard question might be, why did you decide to walk across a butterscotch lake in the first place in snowshoes? Well, it's a calling, all right? <laughs> okay, you be you. 
So allow me with a few, uh, to begin with a few basic explanations to help us get oriented. And then I'd like to go on to interact with some of the specific issues that are sometimes raised in objection. Theocracy means the rule of God. Who can be against that? Right? For if you're a Christian and you believe in God, don't you think that God should rule? Theocracy means the rule of God. Democracy means the rule of the God whose name is Demos, the people. A biblical republic honors the warnings of the true God who has told us about the corruptions of men and of the need for checks and balances, separation of powers, and limited government. That said, now, why do I believe in limited government? Because I believe in sin. <laughs> I believe that sin is something that's not going to go away simply because some bureaucrat is put in charge. In fact, it's especially not going to go away if you put some bureaucrat in charge of anything with no limits. We believe in sin. So, some basics. First, theocracy is inescapable. Theocracy is an inescapable concept. It's not whether, but which. Every society is theocratic. Every society is theocratic. Every society has a god of the system. Okay? The only difference between one society and another is who that god is and how he reveals his will. Who is that god and how does he reveal his will to us? The ethical expectations governing the members of that society are generated by the God of the system, and dissenters are clubbed in accordance with the divine will. Dissenters are clubbed in accordance with the divine will. Every society is theocratic, and every society has blasphemy laws. Right? They don't call them blasphemy laws. We call it hate speech, for example. Right? But I... Just, just like uh, I could go downtown um, in some medieval city and get arrested within 15 minutes on the basis of what I was saying alone, it's no different today. I could go down to Friendship Square and be in the, uh, under the uh, watchful eye of the constabulary within 15 minutes on the basis of what I was saying alone. All I'd, all I'd have to do is stand on a bench open to Leviticus, and start talking about homosexuality. And I would be in custody. Why? Because we have blasphemy laws, just like every society has blasphemy laws. It's not, shall we have blasphemy laws or shall we not? It's, who are you not allowed to blaspheme? Right? Who, who is the god of the system? In Islamic republics, this god is Allah. In secular democracies, it is Demos, the people. In Alabama, it is football. They haven't gotten to the point where they're sacrificing a heifer <laughs> but at halftime, but they would be willing to. There's no such thing, there's no such thing as a society with the great God vacuum at the top. Any society that had no arche to hold it together, no arche at the top to hold it together, would for that reason not hold together. Every society has to have something tying it together. That's what makes it a society. A society without an arche is not a society. So every society has an ultimate point of cohesion, and that point of cohesion, whatever it is, necessarily has religious value. Uh, whatever it is that's holding a people together has, is imbued with religious value. Okay? Sometimes it might be high-profile re religious value, like in Saudi Arabia, Allah says, and so you're going to do it. It's, it's very explicit. Other times, it's backgrounded, but it's still there. So I was born in 1953, and in Eisenhower's America, we were Judeo-Christians. Right? We were Judeo-Christians, and we paid deference to the God of the Bible, and we acknowledged it. We didn't want him to get too close or too intrusive, but he was, he was there. We wanted him on our money. We wanted him in the pledge. In fact, we fought to get him in the pledge. He wasn't put in the Pledge of Allegiance until the 1950s. So every society has some commitment, some committed religious value that holds it together as a society. Second, working the other direction. Every social value has to be grounded or not, justified or not, within the context of a worldview. If Christians commend 
a certain course of action to the larger society. And that larger society stares back at us and asks, asks, why? We think you should do this. And they say, why? How, do, we, do we answer the question? If we answer the question, we do so as Christians, which means that we're going to have a Christian worldview value in our answer, or we just say, just because. If we say, just because, the secularist is going to say, okay, let me take it under consideration. How many of you are there? If you say 30 million, they'd say, well, okay, you can have a place at the table. Right? But, but now we're not appealing to, to the God of the Bible. We're appealing to our lobbying prowess. We're appealing to might makes right. We're, we're appealing to the same God that they appeal to. Right? There's, some, there's a problem with that. So they say, if we, we command a certain course of action. We think you should stop killing babies. And they say, why? Why should we stop killing babies? What do we say? All the ultimate ethical answers to questions that a society faces are answers that have to answer the two basic worldview questions, which are also found on every playground in America. Those two questions are why and who says. Why and who says. You have to come in now. Why? You have to come in. Who says I have to come in? Teacher. All right, well, that's okay. That works. And, and you go, why and who says? Societies don't get to just say, just because. You don't get to say that. You, because some bright sophomore is going to think, this doesn't fly. That doesn't, you can't just say, just because, forever. You can't say, because what's going to happen is you're going to reveal to everybody that there's no point of cohesion. And if there's no point of cohesion, then there is no society. And if there is no society, then you can't blame them for toppling all the statues in it. Because the statues clearly stand for nothing. <laughs> right? That's why we didn't defend them. We had no point of, there's no point of cohesion. Are you with me? So why, why don't these kids love Christopher Columbus? Well, because you don't. Why don't they love George Washington? Because you don't. Nobody around here loves George Washington. Because if we did, we wouldn't be renaming everything. We wouldn't be toppling statues. We wouldn't, there'd be some sort of resistance. So what, what is happening is the rebels, the rioters, the disruptors, the anarchists, the hard leftists have smelled the vacuum. They've smelled the vacuum. There's nothing there. And because there's nothing there, there's no one to defend anything. And a lot of people in Heartland America are kind of vaguely distressed, but they don't have any answers. If, if someone turned to them and said, why shouldn't we tear down the statue? Why shouldn't we be the, change it from the Washington Redskins to the uh, Washington football team? Well, no, no, no. It's the, actually the slave owner football team. Give you a minute. Washington owned, Washington owned slaves. Somebody's going to have to tell the Washington Post. Right. <laughs> Third, we have to deal with the popular connotations of the word theocracy. The word theocracy. By theocracy, people almost always mean evil theocracies. With everything being made worse because it is being done in the name of God. Stealing and pillage is bad enough without it being done under the aegis of heaven. We are here confronted with the, the Iran of the Ayatollahs or the predations of the Spanish Inquisition. That's what people think of if you say, oh, I think we need to, I think, we need to think about theocracy. They're going to think of the Spanish Inquisition in a Christian setting or in an Islamic setting of the Iran of the Ayatollahs. But what word, what word would we use for those who, in the name of Jesus, fought to outlaw the slave trade? William Wilber, uh, they, they were called the Clapham sect. William Wilberforce was their leader, great evangelical statesman, great evangelical leader. He did what he did in the name of Jesus. Was he a the theocrat? Was that theocratic? Or was it just a random act of kindness? Well, if, if Wilberforce fought his whole life 
to get this outlawed. He, it wouldn't have been a random act of kindness. It's, I mean, something's got to sustain you over the long haul. It's got to be the will, something like the will of God, right? What about those who fought to outlaw the slave trade or those who have been fighting for decades now to overturn Roe v. Wade or, or to restore a rightful definition of marriage? If it is done in the name of Christ, it is theocratic. If I'm out there as a Christian saying, no, you can't chop up babies, why can't, and, and they come to me and say, why can't you chop up babies? I'd say, because God said to Moses on Mount Sinai, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not murder. That's why. God says we can't. Well, you're trying to impose your morality on me. You bet. You bet. Of course, because remember, it's not whether but which. It's another inescapable concept. Because in this, this is what law is. Law is the imposition of morality. The only question is whose morality, right? Law is the imposition of morality. So I'd say, yeah, I'm absolutely trying to impose Christian morality on the doctor who would perform abortions and on the mother who wants to procure one. I want to say to them, in the name of God, because Moses said, and the New Testament repeats, thou shalt do no murder. And I'm going to say, no, you can't do that because God, because God said. And they said, but that, that, you're just imposing your Christian morality. And I say, yeah. But notice, before I came into the, onto the scene, you and the doctor were going to impose your morality on the child. Why do you get to impose your morality on the child? I'm not killing you. I'm just preventing you from killing someone. You were going to kill someone. Your morality, your God, your God allows human sacrifice. My God prohibits human sacrifice on the basis of the once for all human sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Christ on the cross put an end to all human sacrifice. So you have a, uh, you have a system, you have a worldview, and you're going to impose your morality on that child without so much as consulting with them. You're just going to impose on that child, take his or her life away, and I'm going to impose on you and say that you can't do that. One time in colonial India, when, when the British were in control of India, there was a case involving sati. Sati was a Hindu practice where a, a widow was burned alive on the funeral pyre of her husband. So when the, when the husband dies, his body was burned and the widow was burned alive uh, with him. That was called sati, S-U-T-T-E-E. And a British judge banned it, prohibited it, and someone objected to the judge and said, but we have, we have this custom. This is our custom. This is what we do. And the British judge said, and we have a custom that when someone does that, we hang them by the neck until they're dead. <laughs> but there's no splitting the difference. You can't split the difference, right? It's a, it's a juxtaposition or a collision of worldviews. And someone's going to impose on someone. Um, and of course, they're going to, and the, why don't we want to say, because God said to Moses, you shall do no murder. Why don't we want to say that? Well, because we're afraid of our Bibles. Because a bright non-Christian, oftentimes the bright agnostic or atheistic uh, non-Christian, some of them are apostate, they grew up in Christian homes, they know their Bibles. Sometimes they know their Bibles better than the Christians do. And they'll come back and say, yeah, God said that to Moses, you shall not commit murder, but God said other stuff to Moses also. Other things to Moses, like you shall not eat shellfish. No shellfish. So, so in your little theocratic paradise that you're going to build for us, are you going to outlaw clam chowder? Um, one time I was debating the, uh, the president of the American Humanist uh, society. I was debating him in Lynchburg, Virginia. They, at Liberty University, they have a replica of the Supreme Court chambers, and we were debating in the uh, Supreme Court there, the, the, the Supreme Court chambers, and he was a secularist, and the room was packed with Christians, and he brought this up. We were debating whether or not biblical law was a foundation for modern law, 
I was saying, yes, it, it is. It needs to be foundational. He was saying, no, it isn't. And one of his arguments was, we can't say that. You, you can't do that because the Bible prohibits the eating of shellfish. So QED, no, that's all you need to say. And so I said, well, uh, you do have a point. God did at one time in redemptive history, God did at one time prohibit his people from eating shellfish. You, on the other hand, in your worldview, you guys believe that we all used to be shellfish. <laughs> and uh, and it, it, it really threw him because um, the, the room was full of Christians and it got a big laugh and he wasn't used to being laughed at on evolution. It was a totally novel um, thing. But... And here's another important, important point to make. We are not going to get anywhere until we stop apologizing for the Bible. Any, and there's nothing in the Bible, once the exegesis is done, you're good with it. I'm not going to apologize for, I'm not going to apologize for what happened to the Amalekites. You know, but the God ordered genocide of the Amalekites. And say, yeah, they deserved it, good and hard. <laughs> and, and then I would say, why do you care about the Amalekites? Isn't God our father? Can't God be pro-choice? <laughs> you can just take us out. Well... There is, this is, these are illustrations of how you can't split the difference between these worldviews. Right? Don't apologize for anything in the Bible. Now, I can tell you, Christian to Christian, that a lot of the misrepresentations and the caricatures that are made of some of the Old Testament dietary laws and stuff are, are wrongheaded and false, and, and uh, you have to look at the whole sweep of redemptive history. And God in the New Testament, God declares all foods clean, and there's a rhyme and a reason and a purpose for it. So we believe in sola scriptura. We also believe in tota et sola scriptura, all of scripture and only scripture, which means that we consider what the New Testament has to say about the Old Testament. We follow it all out, reason it all out. But when the exegesis is done, when, you have done, when you're done with the um, systematic evaluation of all the texts and you know what the Bible says, that's what you think too. That's what you believe too. Not only do you admit it, but you love it. You embrace it. And they, they won't know what to do with that kind of response. One time we were handing out, a number of years ago, we were handing out uh, literature at a local gay dance and handing out tracts. And someone called the local Methodist minister uh, to, sort of for reinforcements to come down and talk to us. And... So he came down to talk to us, and, and I wound up talking to him. And, and I said, well, we're doing this because the Bible prohibits homosexual acts. The Bible says they're an abomination. And he said, well, the Bible allows for slavery. And I said, that's right. What's your point? I'm not going to say, as soon as I start playing, if, as, as soon as my feet start doing that little Irish step thing, that was then, this is now, we have to... Why can't homosexuals play that was then, this is now? That's what they're doing. Right? We've been apologizing for the Bible for decades, and we've shown them the way. We've shown them how to do it. Right? There, there, were, there were women in pulpits long before there were women in cockpits of F-16s. The church was disobedient first. The church drifted first. So if, if we're doing the things that, even they would recognize as good and noble, like uh, uh, eradicating uh, human trafficking, let's say, eradicating sex uh, trafficking. If we did that in the name of Christ, is that theocracy? Well, yeah, it's a public policy thing. It's, it has to, it's out in the public square, it's out in, the, out in society, and we're doing it in the name of Jesus, and we want this to be outlawed. Is that theocratic? Yes, it's theocratic. If we ditch the name of Christ... If we ditch the authority of Christ and the name of Christ in order to avoid being called theocratic, we then have no answer 
to the inevitable why and who says questions that when they come. So um, all, all we could say is, I, I want to protect the unborn. Why? I just feel that way. Well, they feel too. Or they have feelings also. They, they feel like this ought to be allowed. We feel like it ought not to be allowed. And our fe- uh, you know, my feelings don't outrank their feelings. I have, my feelings have no more authority over them than theirs have over me. So I don't want to point to feelings. I want to point to the word of God. God says that we can't do this. God says not to commit murder, and he will judge societies that are murderous. So someone says, we as Christians must protect religious liberty. Why? Who says? And this is one of the things that I'm, I'm sometimes um, bothered by um, uh, some of the some of the good guys, some of the evangelical Christians who are out there fighting the good fight, they will sometimes not see how nothing is neutral. They, and they, they borrow capital from American history, not knowing that this legacy furniture thing that they're borrowing was originally from their Christian great-grandfather. And they, they don't see that, so for example, they don't see that religious liberty is a religious value. Religious liberty is a value that arises out of certain religions and does not arise out of other religions. It does not arise from careful study of the Quran. Careful study of the Quran will not get you to a religious liberty position. Careful study of Scripture will do precisely that. Right? Uh, liberty of conscience, religious liberty, is a Christian historical political development. If you say, if, so if someone says, I don't want theocracy, I just want religious liberty. I don't want to do what Moses said, I just want us to do what Moses said. I don't want to apply the Sermon on the Mount, I just want us to all abide by the Sermon on the Mount. That's what they're doing, that's what they're saying. Religious liberty is not a, a, a value that everyone values equally. And we've seen this in recent days, right? You say, but, but, but you're violating his freedom, uh, freedom of speech. And they say, that's right, what's your point? You don't get to talk that way. That's hate speech. This is cancel culture. You must shut up. You're white, right? You have nothing to say. You must, you must go away. You must go away in humiliation and embarrassment because you simply standing here breathing is an offense to me. And we, and we might do something about that shortly. They don't have the same commitment to liberty that you do. Liberty is not a value that sprang from American soil. It didn't have anything to do with our our latitude and longitude, and it had everything to do with the faith of the men and women who came here, settled this country, and built the institutions that grew up into what we are now in the process of throwing away. Our generation is setting it all on fire, burning it, throwing it away. And a lot of Christians who didn't get the memo are going, wait, what, what, um, how, how, what, d- 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 you're violating, you're, cancel- you're canceling, yes, I am. You're at war with anybody who differs, yes, I am. That's because we are, uh, we are now up against a totalitarian worldview system, and we have not thought out the implications of their worldview, and they have, and worse, we have not thought out the implications of our own worldview. We don't know what on earth we're even defending. Fourth, having said all this, we must carefully distinguish theocracy, which is inescapable, from ecclesiocracy, ruled by clerics, which is entirely escapable and should be escaped. Must be escaped. You don't want to gather all the ministers in your denomination and put them in charge of sewage disposal. (laughs) I hope you don't want that. You don't want to gather up all the men who have been to seminary and put them in charge of the military. You don't want you don't want that. In fact, I think it was I think it was North Carolina, it was one of the Carolinas early on. Um, They had this is a good example of the difference between theocracy, which is inescapable, and ecclesiocracy which is ruled by the church. Remember what I said earlier about monarchy and the Roman Catholic system? 
an ecle- uh, where the Pope is the vicar of Christ on earth, claims jurisdiction in principle over every entity. And that is the ultimate ecclesi- uh, ecclesiocracy, where the church is in charge of everything. We shouldn't want that. This goes back to what the great um, Dutch uh, philosopher, theologian, statesman, Abraham Kuyper. Uh, Kuyper was a theologian, a journalist, a uh, founder of colleges. He was, uh, and he wound up as the, for a stint as the prime minister of uh, the Netherlands. He was sort of a tornado in boots, you know. He was that kind of, uh, that kind of guy. He, uh, he articulated the doctrine of sphere sovereignty. Christ is Lord over all, but there are different spheres, like family, government, uh, civil government, church government. These different spheres have different sets of marching orders from Christ. They're all under the authority of Christ, but they're not under the authority of one another, except insofar as their jurisdictions overlap uh, uh, tangentially. So, um, for example... If we're all here having a Christian con- uh, conference and we've, we've sort of drawn a line and you're not, not in here wearing masks because we've challenged the civil government saying you don't have jurisdiction over that here. All right, so we've said that. But if there was a ruckus out there and a bunch of firemen were peering through the window and they, they said, out, 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 the roof's on fire, uh, we wouldn't say, stay where you are. We need to have a meeting of the ministers to determine whether you can evacuate. Now, our jurisdictions overlap. Right? The, firemen have every, the firemen have every right to evacuate the building in case of a fire. But we all can see and smell the fire. We know that, there's a, we know that the fire is an actual threat. That's an example of jurisdictions overlapping. Uh, in, back to Carolina, they, they d- exhibited their understanding of this by saying, in order to hold public office, it was required that you had to be a uh, Trinitarian Christian. You had to be a Trinitarian Christian in order to hold any political office at all. And you could not be an ordained minister. All right? You had to be a Christian, and you couldn't be a minister. And what they, what they were doing is they're saying, we want to be ruled by God. We want to be ruled by Christ. We don't want to be ruled in the civil realm by ministers. We want the ministers to stay in their lane. We want the civil magistrates to stay in their lane. We want husbands and, husbands and uh, uh, wives to stay in their lane. And we want them all to be answerable to Christ and everybody reading the Bible. All right? that's, an, that's how sphere sovereignty works. So in a Christian republic the church would be a separate and distinct institution from the state. And uh, the other, uh, I I mentioned that in the Roman Catholic view, the the church is over the state. There was another view. It's called the Erastian view, which is that the state is over the church. Um, Named after a guy named, uh, in the Reformation era, named Erastus. And that view is that in fact, this was one of the big battles that Calvin and other reformers had, was whether the church could excommunicate someone who was living in a licentious way without ha- getting the approval of the city council. Uh, the Geneva City Council wanted control over church discipline. And Cal- uh, Calvin had a lifelong battle with his own city council, at putting the lie to the fact that people think that Calvin was the dictator of Geneva. He just simply wasn't. He, there were a number of battles where he, he was exiled once. There were other things where he never, he wanted weekly communion. He could never get weekly communion. He, he fought to the point where he, he, they could discipline loose livers without the uh, state intervening. But other um, reformers like uh, Pierre Verret, the man that we named the Verret Award after we gave a Verret Award last night uh, at the New St. Andrews uh, graduation, he wound up exiled from his city because he wanted to <laughs> he wanted to discipline a man who was running a brothel out of his mom's house and the city council wouldn't let him do it All right so the city council said no well Erastian control is civil magistrates controlling the church the Roman Catholics wanted the church controlling the civil magistrate the 
a position that uh, basically reformed political theology hammered out was a Kuyperian sphere sovereignty issue where everybody is under the authority of Christ, but not everybody is, uh, everybody's answerable to Christ, but not everybody is answerable to one another except in a balances of power, checks and balances um, sort of way. So the separation of church and state is an honored Christian position. It's not the same thing as separating God and state or morality and state or ultimate questions from state. If you were to do that for the sake of combating evil ecclesiocracies, you create a situation where we can no longer ban abortion mills on the basis of something that God said to Moses. This is because agnosticism is now the official religion and who's to say. So when we remove a word from God, we are on our own. If we don't have a word from God, we are on our own. And when we go out on our own, what, is, what happens? Well, 50 million and counting, right? When we're on our own, look at the hash we've made of it. When we're on our own, look how well, look how well we are doing. And you know the drill. If some devout Christian is running for Senate, you know the drill. And he's asked at a press conference, your uh, religious convictions are quite pronounced and you're very conservative and you're a Bible believer. You've, read, you've written these articles and da-da-da-da. What's he expected to say? What does everybody expect him to say? He says, he, if he knows the drill, if he knows his secular catechism, he says, my faith, which is a very precious um, thing in my life, is also very private. And I promise that if elected, I will not allow my private religious convictions to interfere in any way with my performance. So then, and it was, okay, good. And then six months later, he's arrested in DC in a red convertible with a couple of floozies and $100,000 in the trunk of the car and a bunch of cocaine. And he has a press conference. I'm praying for the day when somebody says, I solemnly promise the American people that my private religious convictions, which are very important to me, would not affect my behavior when I got to Washington, D.C. <laughs> in any way, shape, or form. Last, the negative connotation for, the, for theocracy comes about in two ways. Either men establish an idol as the god of their system, and the outworking of this is consistent with evil idolatry, or they establish the name of the true God, but in such a way as to enable them to rule in his name without acknowledging his practical authority. In other, it's either an idolatrous system or it's a distortion of the true system. But if we're Christians, we should want faithful, faithful men to, who read the Bible rightly and who govern in righteousness. The, the, and you can't, you can't protect righteousness by opting into some neutral zone. There is no neutral zone. Our Father and God, we thank you. We commit all this to you. I pray you bless, um, bless us as we consider this last session, interacting on the questions and answers. We give it all to you in Jesus' name. Amen.